as you guys are aware, you're here here for um, a workshop called No No Boundaries: Amazing Wildlife Migrations. We're going to um, kind of focus it on Arizona a little bit, give you a little bit of a historical perspective, discuss um, sort of why animals migrate a little bit, and and along the way throughout, you're going to get some ideas that, for some potential educational components that you could bring in, and then of course we're going to um, show you some resources at the end that you can have access to. So if you stay at the all the way at the end, you'll have an opportunity to. Um, Look at some places where you can get some resources. Everything that we provide to you is going to be available for you for free for download, um, including some of the resources that that, that um, I've been going that, that I'll be using for today's workshop. So let me first start by taking a look at um, you know introducing myself and, and where I work. Obviously, I, I work for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. We are the state government agency responsible for managing wildlife in the state. Um, we are not a a taxpayer supported agency. We're actually we work more like a a business. In some uh, in some aspects, a user pay system. So um, we we don't take your your general income tax, your sales tax money that comes directly to um, to us to to fund wildlife management. My name is Eric Proctor, and and I am the wildlife education coordinator for the department. I've been in that position coming up on on seven years. It'll be seven years next month. Um, and prior to that, I was a former middle school science and, and social studies teacher. I did get a degree in ecology, so I have a science background, but, but really education is my trade. And I say that to tell you that I am by no means an expert on some of these things that we're going to talk about. I have pulled together some resources. In fact, in some cases, I'm going to be reading almost directly from some of the resources that you'll have access to. I've tried, kind of tried to compile them into an interesting um, look at some things. Um, but, but you'll be able to, to pull all this stuff together and use some of these resources in, in your perspective. And maybe we'll give you something a little bit different, um, a different perspective to look at some of these, these migratory, bird, migratory animals in general. And start. Um, obviously, we're talking about migration today. So um, I'm going to ask a very simple question. I, I assume most of you are coming from a science background and education background of some level. But I just wanted to ask a very simple question as far as um, I should say, why do animals migrate? Not who do animals migrate, but um, can you guys give me some some thoughts about why you think that animals actually migrate? Okay, Stacy has seasonal changes. Okay, weather, food. Um, Chris is having some issues, so maybe um, we can work that out um, a little bit. Food to avoid extreme temperatures. Okay, escape the cold. So we're getting two basic themes here. Tends to be, um, and there's a, there's a couple other ones, weather and food, um, as, as well as um, perhaps for reproduction. Okay, and then instinctual and following some others. Good. Um, many animals migrate, which basically means that they do make seasonal movements from one place to another, for typically for purposes of feeding and mating. Um, some travel only a few miles. Others journey great distances. Seals, whales, and salmon, they all swim. Caribou walk. Birds fly. The energy and instincts that come into play when, with migrating animals intrigue us. But for some reason, you know, whatever that might be, people typically tend to be a little bit um, more focused on birds. They tend to have the better stories that people like to say. So we're going to focus on um, the, the birds for the most part. Um, perhaps it's the wonder of flight, the remarkable distances that some of these birds, birds cover, uh, the stamina of creatures you know, as tiny as hummingbirds that, that can travel over the ocean. Um, and so, so we'll be focusing for the most part on birds, although we'll talk perhaps a little bit about some of the other ones. But you can see some common animals that migrate. Not all of these obviously come through Arizona. We don't have caribou in Arizona. We have some of their relatives. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you see sandhill cranes, which we will talk about a little bit later. Um, you see whales down at the bottom. And then, of course, monarch butterflies, which, which go through quite an interesting um, migration, and, and some of them happen to, to come right through Arizona. So those are some common animals that migrate. Um, but of course, temperature is what many of you said, or weather. It, that, is, that, that plays a role, but it's, it's, it's typically not the whole story. We usually think of temperature as the reason birds migrate. Um, but migration is primarily, as many of you indicated, is about food. Okay? Birds that find food throughout the winter rarely migrate. Okay. And you can see some examples there of some, some birds. Obviously, <laughs> there's snow with, with bird prints in it. Um, and you see some nuthatch and a jay up in there um, that, that are existing right there in the snow. These birds don't find a reason to migrate. It's not the cold that's bothering them. Um, they have access to food, their food resources. So they don't need to leave. Okay. Almost all of the 500 or so North American species of birds that migrate depend on weather-related food supplies. That means the insect eaters go south to find insects. But many of the seed eaters, they don't need to migrate because seeds are still available. Right? 
but migration is migration so migration is not t triggered by temperature in fact most migrants leave their northern grounds um, before the cold weather even arrives it's not prompted by hunger either uh, the birds have been eat, busily eating and fattening up for their journeys it's typically considered the photo period which is better referred to as the length of daylight this tells them sort of it is time for their fall journey south or their spring journey north or, or whatever it happens to be to be going on um, the, the lessening daylight hours, they actually cause physiological changes to occur in the bird. Um, these are changes in the functions and the processes of some of their organs. Uh, in some cases, various biochemicals are released, which basically cause the birds to get a little restless. Um, they, they start increasing their feeding. They do additional feeding to add up and to, to store extra energy and fat underneath their, their skin. Um, and there's other sort of behaviors that start to occur based on biochemical changes. Uh, for me, the, the closest example I can provide, to the, the similarity that I have to this is, you know, I, my wife and I have had two kids uh, in the last few years. Um, and as many of you, have, have, if you've gone through this experience, you, you often know that there's something called nesting that, that human women often do when they're pregnant. And, and um, it was frustrating at first until you really get to understand it. And my, my wife went through this phase a month or so before we were going to have both children where they just decided that she needed to clean the entire house and start making the nursery. I ended up painting a whole bunch of rooms as a result of this and moving furniture um, 15 times and, and all this stuff. And, and it, it was really sort of these chemical changes that are being released as she prepares for this baby to get born. Well, the same things are, are on some level are happening with these birds and other animals that are migrating. There, there's these chemical changes that are occurring inside their body that are causing them to basically prepare for this. So we start to see this occur. Okay. Um, temperature may not be an important factor in migration, but certainly weather does play a part. Um, in the fall, as the, as the nights start to cool down, this causes the winds to actually change and gives them steady winds that traveling in the south often. Um, they're, they're pulling down from the, the north and, and giving them easier time to, to go um, south. And the opposite is true when they're returning in, in the other directions. Okay. Just checking to make sure that we've got some, we've had some audio issues. Um, but we'll, they'll continue to work on that. In addition to photo periods, winds, and physiological changes, there's also just the plain genetic factor. Many species of birds are genetically programmed to migrate, and that was sort of indicated in the instinctual comment that um, one, of the, one of you guys said, um, Jan said. Many species of birds are genetically programmed to migrate. Contained within their DNA is the ability to pick up cues. Okay. This prompts them, this gives them the ability to basically use the sun and stars to orient themselves and even compensate for changing sky positions. This is something that we as humans aren't capable of doing naturally. We have to have an, a background in astronomy. We have to have been studying the stars for years to sort of do some of the things that the birds can do naturally. Um, they can sense the Earth's magnetic fields. Again, something we can't do. Um, they can also at times see a band of polarized light at sunrise and sunset. Um, we have to supplement ourselves with, with polarized lenses if we're going to see something similar. And occasionally they can actually um, hear different frequencies. They can hear low frequency sound waves, which alert them to the trade winds and surf and other things like that that help them guide them along their way as they migrate. Um, again, things that we can't hear. These cues, along with just the sort of instinct, the genetic urge to go in a certain direction at a certain time, allows birds to find their way as they navigate across continents and even across oceans. Okay. And so those are sort of the primary reasons why birds migrate and, and animals in general migrate. Um, as with any long journey, I mean, as humans, as, as we prepare for a long journey or any, any journey of any kind, th th there's, there's inherent risks that are involved. If we're going on a car, we have, you know, is, it, is there going to be a tire blowout? Are the brakes going to go out? Um, are we going to lose our wallet somewhere on our trip? There are, are challenges that we face on a long journey. That, and and it really, it's not much different for migratory animals. They're going to face challenges. They're just coming in a, in a different way. Um, the expended energy for long flights is, is going to wear them out, make them more susceptible um, to, to different things. Sudden storms that could blow birds off course, extreme cold spells that could reduce their food supplies. Um, these are all uh, situations that, that could make life-threatening situations in many cases. Um, when you count the, the large numbers of, bird, of animals that often travel together in flocks, um, as they come together to fly, to feed, and to roost, makes them susceptible to diseases. Okay? But perhaps one of the greatest threats 
um, that we have is, of course, humans. And, and a civilization develops and grows and spreads. Um, and, and the greatest in that is being habitat loss, roads, housing developments, shopping malls, farms, logging, drained wetlands, overgrazed grasslands, and other changes that we do to the landscape take away important feeding and resting sites. When large areas of wooded land are removed, only the edges remain. Many predators of birds, including raccoons, squirrels, even house cats, they hang out along the edges of the forest because it's a little bit safer than going all the way in. Um, birds have no f choice but to rest in these dangerous neighborhoods. Um, tropical deforestation is having a devastating effect on birds as well, as, um, as well as the plants and other animals that, 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 that they're affecting. Um, but there's other perils aside from the development. Um, just pesticides sprayed on crops to kill insects. They also kill birds that feed on those insects. High-rise buildings, radio towers, transmission lines, these all kill large numbers of birds, especially at night um, as the migratory birds fly into them. So there are challenges that migratory birds have to face. To give you a real-world example of something that we see here um, in Arizona on a, on a regu relatively regular basis is pelicans. Now, we are, are, are not really anywhere near the ocean. We are a landlocked state. But every year or so, we get a couple pelicans that find their way into Arizona. And not just to like Yuma as they work their way up the Colorado River. They get themselves into Phoenix, okay, in the heart of Arizona, okay, miles and miles and miles away from any large saltwater base that they might be using. Um, they've gotten blown off course. Okay. Often what we find is they come into the southern part of the state, sometimes near Tucson, um, and they end up following the I-10 up. Um, we believe that it may actually be that they think it's a river. They think it's a water source because from up, up in the sky it actually looks somewhat similar. And so they follow that. They end up in Phoenix. You can see some screenshots of some websites I found just today. Now, some of these are older, but you can see one from our, our Game and Fish website alone. A pelican flies off course and visits an urban lake right in Phoenix. There's one from the Boyce Thompson Arboretum where they had a pelican land um, in the middle of the summer. Uh, SeaWorld got about eight pelicans that, were, that had been um, stranded and injured in Tucson that we sent over there. Um, so the brown pelican um, oftentimes comes into Arizona and gets sort of blown off course during its migration. So this is, these are common occurrences. That these challenges are real for these birds. Okay? So one of the things that, that the difficulties that we have is managing migration. As a state wildlife agency, and, and as we look at this nationally and even internationally, the challenge is how do we deal with birds that are migrating? It, it might be simple to deal with an animal that stays in, in, in one spot. Simple being, being a relative term, obviously, but, but looking at it saying, you know, we, we can deal with an animal that's in one spot, but how do we deal with an animal that only spends part of its time here? How can we ensure the protection of that? So we're going we're gonna to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, going back, and, and a lot of what you're going to get is from a curriculum that we developed a while ago, and I've held workshops on this as well, and, and this is a free resource you can download, and you can get all the images and stuff, called America's Wildlife Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. And it's, it's actually based off of something that we call the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation. And the North American model of wildlife conservation comes down to seven basic principles or, or guidelines or tenets, whatever you want to call them. And they're there. I'm not going to read them all to you. But the three that are in, cap, in all caps are, are sort of the, the centerpiece of the story that we're going to be telling today and become three of the, the primary pieces that affect migratory birds or migratory animals in general. Um, wildlife is held in the public trust. We're going to talk about that in, in a little bit. Not, not in tremendous detail, but it's an important concept, perhaps the, the most important of the seven that are here. Um, commerce and wildlife is regulated. Um, and then wildlife is an international resource. And so we're going, to, we're going to sort of tell you the story, but we're going to tell you the story through sort of a historical lens. Okay. And we're going to go back to the passenger pigeon. Okay. I was able, in the last few, you know, as I was preparing for this, I found some historical records of passenger pigeons. And, and you, can, you can read them here, and I'm going to go through them a little bit with you. Um, all, dating all the way back to 1715 is what I was able to And there, there's lots more. I was trying to pick some that were descriptive enough to, to sort of tell the story that I wanted to do. But you have this guy named Ralph Hamer in 1615. And obviously, it's in Old English. This is, this is, he was in the United States, um, obviously not the United States at that time, but he was on in North America um, but obviously still part of the, you know, the, the British Empire. And, and so you can see a lot of it's in Old English, but you can get the idea. Wild pigeons in winter, beyond number of imagination, myself have seen three or four hours um, together in the air, um, so thick that even they have shadowed the sky from us. 
Okay. And that's a common occurrence that we saw with passenger pigeons. And, and when you read account after account after account, was this whole concept that they darkened the sky. In some cases, this, this, this dark cloud of birds, this flock of birds, would extend for miles at length and, and maybe a mile or more wide. Um, so literally, would darken the sky in the middle of the day. Here's two actual poems that, that pulled out these concepts of the passenger pigeon. One was from Thomas Macon in 1729. Here in the fall, large flocks of pigeons fly so numerous that they darken all the sky. Uh, John Holm, probably around the same date, um, it, was, it was undated, but you can, you can read his as well. The pigeons, in such numbers we see fly, that they like a cloud, um, they do make dark the sky. And in such multitudes are sometimes found as that they cover both trees and ground. He that advances near with one good shot may kill enough to fill both spit and pot. Um, so this was, this was a resource that was out there and was out there and, and largely, like most wildlife, was considered to be an inexhaustible resource, something that we couldn't as humans possibly make an impact on. That was the belief. And so you see John, John, um, John Holmes' d description there, an implication there that they were hunting it. And that was indeed one of the things that they did. They used it for a food source. It was an unregulated um, method of use at this time. Okay? Early on, we just sort of saw these as inexhaustible resources, so we didn't see a need to regulate them. Okay? It didn't take long, though, for things to, to change. Okay? And here's a comment, and, and I know it's large, and I, normally I would, I would not put this much in, in a presentation like this, but I, I felt that it told the story a little bit. This is from 1907, a guy named Philip Bruce, who was writing a story about um, kind of the social life of Virginia in the founding of the country and in the early parts of the country. Um, and you can see uh, the clouds of wild pigeons arriving at certain seasons in incredible numbers were killed by the tens of thousands and for many weeks furnished an additional dish for the planter's table. The destruction of the turkey and partridge did not approach that of the wild pigeon, a bird which arrived in Virginia at the same season annually in the course of its migration. And it goes on to describe how people would see these in numbers and, and everybody would see this. One of my favorites is that, um, you know, that for hours they darkened the sky like a pall of thunderclouds and that they broke down by their weight the limbs of the forest whenever an entire flock lighted in search of food. So they would literally nest on these trees and that the trees would, just, the, the, the limbs, the trees would almost bend over from the amount of weight of, of these birds. Um, so thickly did they crowd the woods in different places, and so tame had they become from fatigue and hunger that they were struck down in great numbers with poles reaching up to their perches. They were basically sitting there for people to come in and take. Um, and it wasn't confined to the day. They would do this at night as well. And so all of this sort of made an impact on these birds and, and started, you know, it, it eventually made an impact um, on the passenger pigeon, an animal that darked in the skies. But the pigeons weren't alone. You know, this, this was an occurrence we saw through lots of wildlife, both migratory and, and non-migratory. Here's some waterfowl, some relatively famous pictures of some, some, market, some hunters that had done waterfowl. Now, I do want to make a distinction at this point, and this is, this is going to get in here in, in a little bit, that most of these were market hunters. They were taking this because, because there was, that they could sell this for a profit. This wasn't your, for the most part, was not the, the family hunter who's gathering food for his, for, his, for his family to eat that day or that week or that month. These are the market hunters that are making a, a profit off of this, and so, so that they're making an impact. Now, as you move along and, and time progresses, technology plays a role. And this is a real gun that you're going to see pictured on this slide. Okay, that hasn't been photoshopped in any way. Um, this is called the punt gun, and it's just an example of one of those bits of technology that occurs. Um, it, what, what would happen is this, this gun would actually be mounted on a boat um, that people would have, and with one shot of this gun, they could actually take out 100 or so waterfowl, ducks, at, at one site with just one shot from this gun. Um, so, so technology, gun technology, the, the advent of the railroad as that developed, all this stuff made an impact on animals, both migratory and non-migratory. Specific to migratory, there's what I kind of call the consequence of geography. Migratory birds and, and animals in general, they follow very specific paths. It's not like the entire land is open to them. They have to, follow, they have to, be, they have to follow a path that, that's going to provide them still suitable um, food and, and shelter and water that they're going to need along their journey until they get to their final destination. So in general, that's going to follow very specific paths. This is actually a, a historical image that, that was used to sort of um, promote, to, to sort of put a stop to some of this stuff. But it, it illustrates the point that in, in many cases you had waterfowl and some of these migratory uh, the, the migratory ducks and, and geese and those things, well, they would come from lots of different states. 
But during their journey, as they start to travel south and as they travel back up north, along the way there were only some very specific places that they could stop. So here you have a, a, a conglomeration of birds that, that, that are spread out across states and across the continent that in many cases have to converge in, in very specific bays and, and, and waterways. Okay, so, so you had these massive influx of, of population. Well, the, the, the market hunters would literally just sit at these places during the migration season, and the birds came to them. Okay, here's, a, here's an example of a picture right there. Um, these guys didn't have to do much work. They would just sit at the water grounds that these, that these people would come, and it would become a killing field for these birds. Okay. Now, as I've already indicated, most of this was done as a result of market hunting. You had a demand for the resource. It was a demand for food, for clothing, um, in this case, you see the, the millinery trade, the, women's, the development of women's hats and, and making these stylish hats. They would put bird feathers and bird wings and bird parts onto these hats, and that became a demand. Okay? And so it, it, it became a significant issue. And so we started to, to realize that um, things were happening. You know, and, and really the key came eventually when we started to see some extinctions start to happen. These are three examples of birds that did go extinct, one of them we've already been talking about. You have the great auk that went extinct in the, in the um, mid-19th century, and then the passenger pigeon and the Carolina parakeet that are pictured there as well. Both of these went extinct right around the turn of the 20th century. The early 1900s is when these went extinct. So, so you have these three birds as well as a number of other animals that were either going extinct or were probably on the brink of extinction that started to send a wake-up call to people realizing, wait, wait a minute, the, the, these birds and these re, this resource that we thought we couldn't impact are suddenly making a difference. Maybe we need to do something different. Okay? So there was sort of this call to action that developed within a number of communities. The hunting and angling community stepped up. Um, sort of um, the early environmental crowd sort of stepped up with things like the Audubon Society and the Sierra Club. These groups started to, to pop up and you had the advent of, of now some laws that came into play and we're not going to talk about all of them. A lot of the stuff is covered in, in that, that other curriculum that I've been discussing. Um, but, but we're going to talk about a, a couple key ones. The, the, most, no, the no, most notable getting back to the North American model is this concept of a public trust. It became recognized that natural resources, including um, wildlife being one of those, but, but water, forest, wildlife, all of these things were, were a public trust. And what that means is that they're, in tr that they, they're, they're a resource that belongs to all the people. Not any one individual can own it. So they belong to everybody, and they are entrusted to the government to ensure that those populations are able to sustain themselves for today and into the future, for all generations to enjoy them as well. So while we could all enjoy it, no single person had the right to abuse that, that, that resource. And so that started this idea, and this has been protected by at the three or four at least Supreme Court cases that have upheld this idea of public trust. Even though it doesn't officially occur in the U.S. Constitution, it has been upheld by the Supreme Court as a fundamental role of government to preserve these resources, um, to conserve them and, and make sure that they're used wisely for now and into the future. Um, and so you have this idea of a public trust. Then you also had this advent of, um, we, we had to control the market hunting. And so you had people like John Lacey, who you see pictured on this slide. Now, John Lacey was a representative um, in the early um, 20th century, late, late 19th century, early 20th century. And he passed a law that became known as the Lacey Act. Or he, he didn't pass it himself. He, he introduced it and, and got it through Congress and, and eventually signed by the president. Um, and it became known as the Lacey Act. And what this did was, was this made it illegal, that this, this um, made it illegal. If you killed an animal illegally within a state, okay, you could no longer, it became a federal crime now to transport that animal across state lines. Basically, it dealt with the poaching side of things. So if you took an animal illegally without the right rules, without the right license, without the right permission, if you took an animal within a state, you now couldn't send it out of state because now it become a federal crime. And this was a pretty big deal, because what this did was this put a stop to, this basically essentially ended market hunting. We still had the compliance issues and things like that. But no longer now could you have egrets, which you have pictured there in the lower left-hand corner. Let's say they're, they're hanging out in the, in the wetlands near Florida. You couldn't go down there and hunt and kill um, uh, an egret and then ship it up north by train or, or by boat up to New York to be put into a woman's hat. They, they, they could, that couldn't be done anymore based on this law. 
Okay? And this was really one of the first acknowledgments that um, while states had rights, we, you know, we're in a time right now, uh, you know, as political as things get, there's always this debate between states' rights or federalism and which one, which one has authority. And, and in general, wildlife is regulated by the states. We sort of, it's sort of left up to the states to sort of manage the wildlife within their state. But we also recognize that there has to be some larger authority involved um, because wildlife don't recognize boundaries. They don't know borders. They don't know when they're crossing into another state. Um, and so the federal government does have some authority on some of that. And, and, and that also requires some international cooperation. This is getting that idea that wildlife is an international resource. We can put all the protections we want in place and try to protect and, and get rid of pesticides or whatever it might do to protect those ducks or those eagles or whatever it might be. But if, if they're then going to some place that we don't have control over and they're not implementing the same restrictions, all those efforts that we're doing here may be lost. And so this is one of those issues, wildlife, Water is probably one of those as well, that if it's not, if you don't have cooperation among separate groups and some kind of agreement on how it's going to be managed, anything that you do is, is going to be somewhat limited and, and isn't going to be as effective as it could be. So recognizing this idea that we need to have a larger authority looking at it and, and, and seeing that it, we can't just reserve it to local power, that, that local, a lot of action can be done locally, but we do need to have some stuff that's, that's handled at the federal level and in many cases at the international level. And so that's kind of what... Um, and so we passed the Lacey Act. There were some other migratory things. We had the Migratory Bird Act that was passed later, um, which basically protected, um, made it illegal to, to basically have any bits and pieces of, of a migratory bird. You couldn't have their nests. You, could, you couldn't do anything with their nests. You couldn't have their feathers. You couldn't have the birds themselves. These are things that are sort of protecting these birds and putting them in, in place. And then we did other things like the, the Bald Eagle Protection Act for very specific things. We, we started to get rid of DDT and some of those pesticides. And all of these things made an impact. And then, of course, making a larger international presence and working with some of these other countries has, has helped with the management of this. But it's still a very, very complicated issue. Um, but that's kind of a brief overview in history of the, um, the, 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 the wildlife perspective uh, and the management perspective. So we're going to look at some, some common Arizona species. Now, some of these that I've gotten out of here um, actually come from a curriculum guide. And actually, the beginning part of this presentation, I actually stole from a curriculum guide that was developed um, by the Tucson Audubon Society. So you'll have to excuse some of the references that are somewhat specific to, to, to northern Arizona. But, um, you know, there's a, there's, it's, um, there's a lot more that we, could, that we could potentially cover. But just to give you a brief idea of some of the regular visitors that come through Arizona, uh, we have animals that spend the summer here. This often includes things, you can, you can read them there, turkey vultures, elf owls. Um, we have the hooded oriole that comes through, the black-chinned hummingbird that comes through and, and spends the summer in here and then leaves for the winter. Okay. You have winter residents, so animals that come here for the winter and then leave to go for the summer. This includes um, some, some hawks and a hawk and a harrier, a couple different hummingbirds, a sparrow. And then there's some animals where we're just sort of a pass-through, that the animals are passing through on their way from traveling north or south. That includes the rufous hummingbird. We're going to talk a little bit more about him and, and there, as well as a Swainson's hawk. Um, in some cases, in the um, and you, you see a couple others agree, which is a, a waterfowl, like kind of like a duck. Um, and so there's a couple different regular visitors that we get. And again, this is just a very small sampling of, of what we get in there. Um, but let's take a look at three in particular that, that, that I'm kind of most interested in, um, what I call sort of the great migrations. And, and you can see them illustrated on this map here that I just sort of threw together. There's, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is the exact path that they follow. But you get, a, you get a rough general idea here of what we're looking at. And there's three different colors. There's the blue, which represents a sandhill crane. There's the green, which represents a Swainson's hawk. And there's the red, which represents a rufous hummingbird. And you can sort of see their path of where they start and end. Um, and, and the sandhill crane, so they, they, the sandhill cranes actually go all the way up into Russia and Siberia. There, there's some aspects that come into there. Not sure if those ones are the ones that make it all the way to Arizona or not. Um, but, but we do sort of have that. But, but in general, sort of Alaska and, and the northern part of North America coming down, and they actually come down and, and make their way. They kind of follow along the Platte River for a while and, and head into Nebraska, and they stop in Nebraska for a while. And then they make their way over to Arizona and California and some of those other places. We get a, we get a, a small percentage of them, um, but we do get them. And it's actually, if you come in in December and in January in particular, down into southern Arizona and into the Sulphur Springs area, you go 
down to a place called Whitewater Draw, which is a property that Game and Fish owns. Um, you go down by Bisbee, basically, is where we're talking about it, and, and Wilcox. There's Wilcox Playa, which is known for this. And every year, they basically celebrate the Sandhill Cranes with a festival called Wings Over Wilcox, which is a big birding festival that they have, and they often do tours. But it's, it's a phenomenal experience um, that that occurs when you can go there in January and every morning that thousands and thousands of these sandhill cranes lift up to go, you know, get food and, and sort of hang out for a little bit. And then every night in the evening before sunsets, they all come back down and, and loaf in these, in, in the waters that are in this area. And, and they'll, they'll just kind of spend their time here. And then they travel back up um, to go to, to go to Alaska or, or Northern Canada, Northern, Northern um, um, America, wherever they're going to end up going in the end. Um, so, and this is a large bird. It's, it's not a, it's not a small old bird, but it's a phenomenal experience to go see down in Southern Arizona and, and over in the Cibola National Wildlife Refuge gets a few of them as well, kind of over on, on the border right there on the Colorado River. The other one is the, the Rufus Hummingbird. Okay. And we have actually some activities, and this is an activity you could do, and, and one of the, the links you're going to get towards the end at the educational resources shows the Rufus Hummingbird and the Swainson Hawk migration, basically the same map without the um, without the, the routes drawn in, and you can have your kids do that. They can actually, you can have them use string to sort of trace the path um, of where these animals are and then calculate how many miles they travel. And so this is a, a pretty easy activity that you can have kids doing. You could imagine, imagine if you were able to get a large map on, on your wall or on your floor and have kids map this out as well. And, and really do that. But the, the, the Rufus Hummingbird often stops and, and, and kind of goes in Alaska. Um, there's, there's a number of them that live in, in basically Cordova, Alaska, which is kind of east of Anchorage right there. And you can sort of, I try to place a dot as close as possible. And it makes its way basically down along the coast and eventually makes its way into southern Arizona, uh, pretty common in the Sierra Vista area. But then, again, they just pass right on through Arizona, and they make their way all the way down to a place um, in sort of central Mexico, um, where, they, where that's their winter home, and they kind of hang out there for the winter, and then they travel the, the, the same pathway back. Okay? And so imagine having... Um, having you know, your kids trying to figure out what is the round trip of this tiny little hummingbird. Okay? A thing that just weighs a few ounces is making this massive trek. Okay? And, you know, something that, that we can't even imagine doing if we were going to walk it, because you know, we certainly can't fly it. But here's this bird that does this on a yearly basis. Okay? Swainson's hack, the hawk is kind of the same thing. Okay? Now, Swainson's hawk is, is much larger, but it's a raptor. So it's going to follow the land. It doesn't really go over the ocean too much, so it's going to follow the land. But they kind of... Um, you know, they, they, their summer home is sort of in Phoenix, and they're, they're common in Phoenix, they're common in sort of other parts of Arizona, but imagine them sort of hanging out in Phoenix, where, where I'm positioned right now, um, and they can fly in some cases all the way down to Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires, Argentina, okay? and again, following over land, so they're going to kind of pass through Central, Amer Central America and down through South America, and this is what they do every day. Now, if you have this on a, on a, on a different map, okay, and imagine all the different countries now that sort of have to work together for the, for the sake of the Swainson's hawk. How many countries does this animal pass through? Okay. You know, and and if, if you start removing land out of one of those, if you develop one area or removing suitable habitat for it to find food or to find shelter, because it can't make the trek on its own in, in, in one flight. It's going to have to take spots to rest. Well, where is it resting? If it doesn't have places to rest, can it make the flight? If you, if you remove one of those areas, can it, can it fly the longer distance to get to the next rest stop? Those types of things are important questions that you can start asking, that, that students can start thinking about and can start analyzing and can start researching. Okay? Um, you know, and these are countries that have to get together. You could have ki um, kids compare the summer and winter habitats. Okay? Look at Phoenix, Arizona. Look at Buenos Aires, Argentina. What's similar about them? What's different? What resources is the bird getting at in Argentina that it's not getting at Phoenix during the winter? Okay. Those, are, those are some important questions that some kids can start answering. But these are some of the big migrations, and I don't think in, in many cases kids are very aware of this, um, these types of things. I mean, those, those are miles upon miles of, of areas that these, these birds are traveling. Okay. Now, there is this other bird that is sort of a little bit unique in the bird world. And I mention it because it is a migratory bird, but interestingly enough, not all of them migrate. Okay. 
This is a bird that was, um, we have first early records of it actually by Meriwether Lewis, of, of obviously Lewis and Clark fame. And he, he, he wrote this in his journal on October 16th, 1804. And, and I'm not going to read it for you, but you can see a reference to this bird. He says, this day I took, took a small bird. And um, at the time, that was what they classified it as. Um, it, it later was determined that it was part of what was called the common poor will family, um, which is related to night, night, night jars They're signed, uh, and closely related to owls. Um, they look a little bit like an owl, kind of a flat owl. Um, but you can see here that um, it appeared to be passing into the dormant state. On the morning of the 18th, and the mercury was at 30 um, above zero, the bird could scarcely move. And so he's literally taking a knife and he's cutting this thing up and, and the bird's not doing anything. It's still alive, but it's not doing anything. Now, a lot of people didn't really take note of that um, until the 20th century. Um, and in 1948, uh, a researcher, Dr. Edmund Yeager um, was kind of out in the Chuckwalla Mountains, California, and discovered this poor will was just kind of sitting there. It hadn't really buried itself. It was kind of in a crack, um, surrounded by some rocks, and was just kind of there, blending into the rocks. Um, and it was basically hibernating. Okay. Um, Kind of interesting. Now, this is a bird that is known for migration, and, and typically it does migrate, but every now and then, a few of these birds decide that they don't want to migrate, and they go into what is largely described as a hibernation. Okay, let me pull some of my... Um, and in fact, it's been known, you know, this, this bird, the poor will, is called the sleeping one by the Hopi Indians. Um, it's a unique bird found in Arizona. It belongs to the nightjar family birds, as I always, already explained. Um, they usually nestle up in a crack or hole in a rock because their main food source is insects, which are not easily found at this time at this time of year. These birds lower their metabolism so they will not have to eat. They also lower their body temperature, sometimes dropping at 60 degrees or more from what its normal temperature is. In fact, biologists have observed some of the lowest body temperatures ever found in birds in wintering poor wills. So some of the lowest body temperatures they've ever observed in, in, in birds has been observed in poor wills during their wintering phase. Okay. We've also learned that they don't remain inactive during the entire winter. Instead, poor wills alternate between inactivity and action. They become active every so often as food becomes available or as temperatures rise. Think about it in Arizona. We tend to have these mild winters sometimes where we'll go, um, at least in the Phoenix area, it'll be really cold for a week or two and then it'll warm up for a little bit and then it'll get cold again. Well, during those warmer phases where some insects might appear, they, they become active and they get some food and then they go back into this inactivity phase. Okay. It's actually kind of fascinating. Um, and no other bird is really known to do this. Um, that, that we know. Um, and so this becomes another, another interesting educational opportunity for students is, is, yes, you can talk about migration, but this is also a way to talk about some of the other behavioral adaptations that animals do to survive seasonal changes. Most scientists now are kind of agreeing that this, this bird, this, this poor will, is not actually entering into a full hibernation, um, but is actually entering what's called a torpor which is um, a little bit different. It's usually a short period, perhaps a day or so, in which an animal lowers its metabolism and body temperature in order to survive. This often occurs at night when temperatures become much cooler. Um, and so they think that this bird may actually be going through a torpor, but some scientists argue that it is longer than a day or two, and in some cases it might be a month or more that this bird goes in the space with so actually hibernation. Okay. And then you have the complete, uh, something different that other animals do, which is estivation. Estivation does not occur in the winter. Instead, it's used by animals to help them survive hot, dry summers. To estivate, animals typically burrow into the ground where temperatures are cooler and lower their metabolism. Many animals in Arizona, including species of reptiles and amphibians, estivate. Okay? And so now you have these three things that are very similar, okay? but, um, but are still distinctly different. So how about having the, the, the kids um, doing a simple Venn diagram with these three things, hibernation, torpor, and estivation, and comparing and contrasting them? What are they? Can they identify animals that do them? Maybe you even throw migration in there. And why is, you know, how is migration different? Obviously, it's got some very distinct differences. It's a completely different um, thing. But it's still a behavioral adaptation that animals have done to survive seasonal changes, in this case, food source. Um, and, and how are they different? So having the kids analyze that and these three different things and the animals that do them and maybe debating, is the poor world in hibernation? Is it in torpor? Now you, could, you could stage a whole debate on that, having kids on both sides of that. 
um, would, would be kind of fascinating. This actually, we're, we're just about done here. Um, but I, I wanted to provide, you know, another simple thing is just looking at the migration and, and how about, you know, teachers often are looking for bell ringers or sort of um, activities to get started to, to start the day off a little bit um, or always looking for different review type activities. So here's three examples of some sort of simple math activities you could run based on some of the migration that we've talked about. Um, in Arizona, we have roughly 500 species of birds. We actually have a few more than that. Um, of these, about 240 migrate to the neotropics. Um, it's not 240 that migrate, it's 240 that migrate to the neotropics. Um, so looking down south and, and into Mexico and Central America and that area. Um, about how many species of birds do not migrate to the neotropics. So again, depending on the, the math ability of your students and what grade level you're working on, there's some, you, you can do some triple digit, three digit subtraction. Um, you can do percent, what percent of students um, of, of bird species found in Arizona visit the neotropics. So looking at percentages and they're going to get roughly half. Um, the elf owl spends summers in Arizona from April to October, roughly, um, and it spends the rest of the year in its home in Mexico. How many months does it spend in Mexico? Again, they have to figure out, you know, it's, it's an easy problem, but, you know, you have to figure out, oh, there's 12 months, how many, how, you know, what is it between April and October? How many months does it spend in Mexico? What percentage of year does it spend in Arizona? What percentage of year does it spend in Mexico? Uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird, another cool hummingbird flies 500 miles nonstop over the Gulf of Mexico. It actually travels over water for 500 miles. Okay? The trip takes 25 hours to complete. Okay? So what's the, the hummingbird's average speed in miles per hour? What if you converted it to kilometers per hour? Could you figure that out? Okay? And so these are some simple activities, just taking this concept of migration and integrating in some of these other things. You can see through the course of this presentation, we've been able to integrate in some social studies and history when we've looked at um, some historical accounts of the passenger pigeon. Um, we've been able to incorporate some government with the idea of um, the laws that were passed with the Lacey Act and, and sort of the development of, of those laws. We've been um, able to um, incorporate some math here as well. And, and absolutely, as Stacy indicates, it's better than sort of making up stuff and, and imaginary word problems. One of my biggest frustrations when I was teaching was, um, and it wasn't specific to word problems, but when I was doing projects, particularly like graphing and stuff with, with, with students, you know, and I, and I taught seventh grade, and it was still one of those ages where you're still trying to get them to understand graphing and why do we graph. And, and it came to me that one of the, one of the reasons we don't, they don't understand graphing is they don't understand the importance of graphing. Um, you know, because we give them, um, <laughs> we give them um, four points to graph, and they have to make a bar graph with four points. And, and, and they don't understand this. They don't see the purpose of saying, well, I can tell which one's bigger. And they don't see why the visual representation of the data impacts. So they've never had enough data, and they've never had really relevant data. It's always been, you know, these made-up problems that, that, that may or may not work and, and stuff like that. So when I came to Game and Fish, that was one of the things that I wanted to really do, is we had a wealth of data available to us. Why not put that out there for the teachers to use and find interesting ways and examples that they can use in their classroom? So that's what we've tried to do. And you can see that here. These are some real-world examples of students um, that, that have some animals that they may or may not be familiar with. Um, you could introduce them. You could show some pictures. You could make it just a little bit more engaging and then throw in some math problems to go along the way so you're addressing some other standards along the way. Um, and there's my information. Um, if you wish to call me or email me, email me is probably the best. Uh, I'm, I'm in and out of the office, in particular over the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm, I'm going to be out of the office probably more than I'm in the office, um, but, I, but I do check email, especially if I'm traveling the state. I can get online at a, a hotel and, and, and check email. And then there's the website I just referenced as well, and you can check out all the resources that we have access to.